Welcome here. My name is John Martins, the director of the Center for Christian Engagement. In just a moment, I'll introduce the speaker for the evening, Dr. Alexander Martins, who will discuss care for the destitute sick and Christological foundations in Catholic healthcare. First, I wanna offer some thanks and some gratitude. The land on which we gather is a traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We're thankful for their welcome to us so that we can live, learn, and pray on their land. I'd also like to thank our partners for this lecture tonight. This event is part of the Visiting Scholar and Ethics Program presented by Providence Healthcare, St. Paul's Foundation, and St. Mark's College. And this partnership is made possible by the Archdiocese of Vancouver. I'd also like to thank those of you who came in person this evening and to the many more of you who are at home watching and joining us virtually. We're also thankful at the Center for Christian Engagement for the Cullen family for their generous support of our lectures here at the center and at the colleges. And I also want to thank the donors to the Center for Christian Engagement whose generosity enables our work to take place. Peter Bull, Angus Reed, and Andy Zox. I would also like to encourage you to continue to engage after this lecture by letting people know that it will be available on our YouTube channel and that the work of our center can also be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, on our podcast, What Matters Most. And I'll also ask you, save the dates for our upcoming international conference on Pope Francis, Pope Francis and the Future of the Church, Prospects and Challenges for Renewal on May 4th to 6th, 2023 here at St. Mark's. But we need to talk about our speaker now, Alexander Martins. He's a theologian and bioethicist from Brazil, and he's also a nurse, and I think that's very important. He received a PhD in theological ethics and bioethics from Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he studied bioethics and global public health from a liberation approach. He, then he received a postdoctorate degree in democracy and human rights from the Human Rights Center at the Law School of the University of Coimbra, Portugal. He has a number of specializations in healthcare ethics, social ethics, especially in the areas of public health, global health, community-based approach in Catholic social teaching. His scholarship has been broad and widely published. He's written in Portuguese, English, and Spanish, a genuine international scholar. He's written on COVID-19, Politica e Fe, which was published in Brazil, The Cry of the Poor, Liberation Ethics and Justice in Healthcare. And he has an upcoming book, Christology and Global Ethics, Methodology for Bioethics from the Margins, and that's scheduled to be out later this spring. As a healthcare provider and global health advocate, he served in middle and low income countries throughout the world, Brazil, Haiti, Bolivia, Uganda. And he's currently assistant professor at Marquette University. His talk tonight will examine how and why care for the destitute sick, the oppressed and the poor are essential parts of the mission of Catholic health care and essential parts of the mission of Jesus, but also his followers. After Martin's talk, I'll open up the questioning to the audience members, both those who are here in person and those who are watching from home. So if you're at home, get your questions ready. You can send them uh, via the question and answer uh, function on the webinar, and we'll be monitoring them. So please welcome Dr. Alex Martins. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martins, too. <laughs> yeah, we just have a little different spell in one single letter, but uh, pronounced almost the same. Uh, thanks for the generous introduction. Thank you all who come uh, tonight here. Uh, for this talk, those who are watching and listening on Zoom. So it's my pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and I will uh, present my talk today, and I have the, the speech I prepared, trying to sh develop uh, some aspect of my upcoming book. I, it's very interesting because just yesterday I received the proof <laughs> from the, my editor, and said, I need that back next week. But, oh, I'm very busy this week to work on that right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm excited, it's always excited for a scholar when you have a book like Start When You Are Start to See the 
a, a book format. Uh, and it, it's, I'll present some of those uh, ideas I have, I have developed in the book, like the first time exposing that, and, and hopefully if you have more interest when the book is out, you let you know you can continue the dialogue. So uh, as it uh, was introduced, I would develop a Christology by focus on a specific field related in healthcare ethics, like Christology in healthcare ethics. When we work in ethics, sometimes we are very often criticized for not using the Bible enough if you are a theologian. And I am trying to break that, that criticism and build a bridge between uh, theological ethics, but more specific theological bioethics in terms of healthcare and Christology, but a Christology developed from a particular a biblical passage. A capital communities have developed many projects and create uncomfortable institutions to serve the sick. Historically, the Catholic Church has always acted in the field of healthcare, primary caring for the destitute sick. In many places, the first hospital were created by the Catholic Church and her members. Thus, when one thinks about global health as an institutional collective endeavor to address health disparities and promote health and well-being, particularly in regions marked by poverty, although the term global health is all secular terms, it is fair to recognize that Catholic institutions and communities has, have a great activism in this field across the globe. It does not seem controversial. The statement that care for the institute seek is a key element of the Catholic mission. In my experience in the field of global health, engaging with and from a theological approach, I often highlighted the mission of the Catholic Church to care for the sick by directly addressing where this care should be delivered. I then talk about how to promote this care as well as who must be partnered with it. With considerations for the global health context, we are placed in the reality of the poor where those most vulnerable to ill to illness are ill and they suffer due to the lack of proper health care. This leads us to focus on the need for a preferential option for the poor in health care. A Catholic social principle that I present as a guide for efforts in promotion of health and well-being for the most disadvantaged in our society. In fact, It is, a fact, so it is a fact that the main cause of healthcare issues, disease, and premature death is poverty. The, there is a, a friend of mine who died last year, he used to say the bacteria and the bugs all day did a preferential option for the poor. Uh, because that's true, when you're poor, you're most vulnerable, especially for infectious disease in poor areas. The single cause created a vicious cycles that begin with injustice and end with death, premature death. Poverty is not a natural phenomenon, but a socioeconomic creation that makes people vulnerable to fall ill. Once sick, a poor person does not have access to the medical care needed to recover. This leads to more suffering, making people poor and sicker. As a result, the poor person dies in the process of denial of his or her dignity. Even rich countries suffer with this reality, with poverty and lack of access to proper health care impacting marginalized communities. And the COVID showed that very explicit for us, especially when I look for United States, a country, a rich country that I engage with, we see how disproportionately COVID impact marginal, historic marginalized communities. Consider this fact, the preferential option for the poor guide us to a perspective that places the poor at the center of the global health efforts in order to break this vicious cycle. This Catholic social principle invert the most common logic of uh, global health or public health governance, 
from a top-down approach that's most common to a top-up approach. Therefore, we look at the global health challenge from the social locus where these victims of structural violence are in a perspective from below. This approach recognizes value in the experience of the poor and include their voices at the center of our discussion and actions in global and public health. That being said, I have to make a self-criticism, which also applies for many works in theological ethics and Catholic bioethics. This criticism concerns presenting Catholic social principles such as a preferential option for the poor as important resources for global health and public health, especially in a reality marked by poverty. These presentations often show to be pragmatic in their aspect of guide actions of the principle, but sometimes forget to present their foundations, most notably the biblical foundations. So I have realized we always go to the praxis. Preparing to the poor is good, let's act. And my goal here is to step a little before the action and show the foundation that ground our praxis and ground in a Christological foundation that has uh, a biblical uh, element on this. So trying to find in our uh, tradition the foundations for the preferential options for the poor in global health. So as you, you can see in the slide now, that will be uh, my trajectory here. In the first, I want to present like a biblical foundation for the Catholic mission in global health. And second, I want to do a little exercise, and forgive me for that, Dr. Martins, uh, exercise of uh, as a exegetical exercise of a biblical passage where I can show that foundation uh, and then conclude with a liberation approach that actually go back to the praxis that that foundation can uh, support us. So, biblical studies and those related to the pastoral care have significant scholarship about the healing aspect of the historical mission of Jesus and how the church has continued this mission throughout history. It is common to see Catholic institutions state that their mission is to continue the healing ministry of the church. Here on top, we have the Providence Health that say that very clear in their mission. And I quote, inspired, by the healing means of Jesus Christ, Providence Healthcare is a Catholic healthcare community dedicated to meeting the physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs of those served to compassionate care, teaching, and research." End quote. Gospel passages with Jesus caring for the sick are regularly presented to illustrate the biblical foundation for this healthcare mission. There are many of those passages in all four Gospels. Jesus healed people with skin disease, a woman with unstopping hemorrhage, bleeding man, a child, and even brought back the life of his dear friend Lazarus. Perhaps the most repetitive action in the Gospels is related to his ministry to the sick, most of them poor and marginalized. In addition, Jesus told the stories to show the importance of caring for those who are sick. These stories include the parable of the Good Samaritan and the allegory of the Last Judgment. And it quotes from the Gospel when Jesus said, I was sick and you visit me. There are no doubt that the historical meaning of Jesus has the care for the sick at the center particularly the impoverished and marginalized sick. This care is in turn placed at the center of the mission of his followers. The connection of the sick and the poor was present in the meanings of Jesus and most Catholic health institu institutions highlighted this connection in their mission statement. It's very common when you see mission statement values, preference for the poor is 
nine of 10 times there in any Catholic health institutions, including our here in Tal Providence Health. One can say that the option for the poor is clear present in Jesus' ministry for the sick. Continuity's ministry means option for the poor in healthcare as well. We need to receive that action, the action of the historical Jesus in order to understand his options and his actions and the relevance of it for the ministry of the Catholic Church. Consider how Jesus conducted his existence, the choices he's made, going where life was most threatening to help the poor, the sick, and the suffering, and his cry against all forms of injustice and oppression that hurt people's dignity. It's impossible, it's, sorry, it's possible to know in a very concrete way that Jesus chose to promote all human lives, beginning with those who have been prevented from flourishing with dignity. Moreover, he was killed because his choice of promoting the life of the oppressed and marginalized. It was a redemptive death, freely accepted, that united historical and eschatological salvation. Therefore, the eschatological salvation is a continuation of the historical life with dignity sustained by justice. Where this has been broken by oppression, poverty, and marginalization, the mission of the church is to work to rebuild justice, to sustain human dignity. Inspired by Jesus' deed and teaching, the historical mission of Jesus' disciples include the defense and the promotion of life with dignity for those bearing the burden of oppression and its consequences, such as the impact of health inequalities. Following Jesus means making his choices, going to where the poor and the oppressed are crying out for help, for health and for dignity. The Beatitudes of Luke in the chapter six show how blessed the poor, the hungry, and those who weep are. They will have the kingdom of God and will be satisfied and comforted. And happy are those who are persecuted for Jesus' sake. That is, for being Jesus' disciple, following in his footstep and proclaim the good news to the privileged recipients. Catholic Health Ministry must understand that its mission is to go to where the poor, the hungry, the weeping, suffering are. This is the Samaritan solidarity, marked by the union between physical care, such as medical assistance, and social care, such as a fight against health inequalities. As a social virtue stated by Pope Saint Pope John Paul II, solidarity is unifying these two steps of caring for the sick, the practical action and the social activism. The Episcopal Conference of the Latin American Bishops presents very clear that Jesus' actions communicated the historical mission of the church for promoting life here and now. Although the Gospels present Jesus discoursing about his ministry, it is through his own action that his teaching gained mean and concrete relevance pointing out the value of life and to where his disciples should go to promote. Jesus had a posture of gratuitousness, with unconditional acceptance of the other. He was not afraid of criticism and made his life an expression of love in total self-giving to the other, to the point of offering his own life. Jesus' life revealed an authentic existence and rescued us from the slavery of an individualistic world. So we experience the mystery of communion with God and our neighbor. This mystery is capable of leading by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Catholic health ministry to serve the sick who is not only suffering because 
in illness, but also the impoverished sick who cries for justice, revealing that his or her illness is a result of injustice and health inequalities. The document of Brazil, the Latin American bishop said, and I quote, faced with exclusion, Jesus defends the right of the weak and the dignified life of the ever human being. From his master, the disciples have learned to fight against every form of disdain of life and exploitation of the human person, end quote. Jesus' ministry is marked by caring for the poor and the sick. It's possible to deny that when you read the gospel. This is clear. Ground on the gospel's message, Catholic Health Ministry has no choice but make it in healthcare a service, service a work for the poor who is disproportionately vulnerable to fall ill, and then are prevented from finding proper medical assistance. This, in many cases, lead to premature death. Catholic ministry cannot pick and choose where and who to serve, especially if the choice is playing in a health market for those patients who can pay or have private health insurances. Guided by the Christological faith, Catholic Health Ministry is above all for the impoverished and marginalized sick. Thus, the option for the poor is at the center of this ministry. In the document of Aparecida from the Latin American bishop that was one of the main hands who wrote the document was the Cardinal of Buenos Aires at the time, who became Pope Francis a few years later, uh, state that the preferential option for the poor is an option from our Christological faith. And this is very important. Pope Francis repeat that in his first document, uh, Evangelio Gaudio, and again in the Laudato Si, saying that preferential option for the poor is not like a political or a sociological option, first of all, but is an option that comes from the gospel. And to attend the common good, we need that option. For Pope Francis, that is very clear. Those who care for the sick need to embrace the preferential option for the poor as an ethical imperative originating in our Christological faith that's necessary to lead us and all of our community, members in our communities to attain the common good. So it's important to understand what means to attain the common good. That's some expression that Francis used. This expression means in healthcare, in, well, in the context we work. It means that continue the healing means of Jesus is not simply provide health care for those who are sick. It is not simply a designation of some health care resources for those who are poor as an act of charity, charity, sorry, or as a humanitarian effort to help suffering, impoverished people. This is only a part of the ministry, which addresses a small piece of the problem and does not effectively lead impoverished people and oppressed populations to attain the common good. The preferential option for the poor shows that continued the healing means of Jesus is also fighting against the system and the structures responsible for creating poverty and oppression. It's a call to be prophetic in the system that creates an environment that makes people disproportionately vulnerable to illness and lack proper health care when they are sick. Continuing the healing meanings of Jesus in history does not mean playing with socioeconomic system like some cattle system, unfortunately in some countries where you do it, just keep playing the market system as any other system uh, and maintain the same structure without change anything and justify that they provide some charity for the poor as the part of the ministry, the Catholic ministry. So being prophetic is go beyond that game to play in a 
private market that happens some, in some places. And that requires from us a prophetic uh, perspective. Now what I want to do with, you hope my colleague here, forgive me, he's a biblical scholar, with a little exegetical uh, exercise. And I will do a little out of the script here, not reading, in order to be a little more clear. Here has one of my favorite passages in the Bible uh, that looks 4, 16 to 30. I have studied that Bible since I was doing my uh, theology program many years ago. It's one of the passages probably I read most in the Bible. And this you can read there. I will not read for you, but it's that passage that Jesus on Luke basically tell that passage for us, and he read a passage of the prophet Isaiah. And that passage in prophet Isaiah is very uh, iconic here because it is a programmatic. It's like Jesus presenting his program, especially the program of actions platform, which is a term for all today, of his action, especially during his time in the Galilee, that the Bible called the, the Galilean ministry of Jesus that go through like eight chapters of the gospel until he goes to Jerusalem. Uh, and then he said in that passage, like his objective is to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to sign to the blind, to free the oppressed, and to proclaim the ear acceptable of the Lord. All these come from the tradition of the Old Testament. So the Galilee ministry, that you can see there, how the, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, they didn't use simply copy and paste the passage of the prophet Isaiah. They kind of rearranged that. Uh, and they pick the passage that you make sense like, for example, excluding those passages like the day of the vengeance of our Lord. The Gospel of Luke is all about mercy. To have like a God that wants to revenge doesn't seem to make sense to the main message the, the writer wants to provide. So the, what the main message is to proclaim the acceptable of the Lord. The Jubilee year. The year when we forgive debts, we give back the land, we let the land rest for time, not do anything to plant. I'll think that when you think environmentally, make a lot of sense today. Let the land last. You cannot just keep exploring. Uh, according to Luke, Jesus' ministry is centered in his five core aspects to bring the good news to the poor. That means the poor is the privileged recipient of the gospel. That means good news. To proclaim the liberty to the captives, give new opportunity and freedom for those who made something wrong. That is mercy. To sign the blind, to heal the sick, to care for the disabled to free the oppressed, promotion of freedom from oppression, and to proclaim the year accept of the Lord, build a new time that allowed us to build a new society based in God's justice. This create an equilibrium that match the dynamics of human societies in which all aspects of its development are interconnected. Hence, Jesus' ministry reveal actions for integral development, as stressed by the Catholic social teaching, first by Pope John Paul VI. This teaching suggests that the mission of the Catholic Church to continue the healing ministry of Jesus is not limited to care for those who are sick. It also includes a prophetic praxis, which include the poor toward attain the common good and free the oppressed from structures of oppression and injustice, which are responsible 
for the vicious cycles I mentioned before. Poverty, disproportionate vulnerability to get sick, sickness, lack of health care, premature death. Bring the good news to the poor and proclaim the year acceptable of the Lord. In health care, include care for the sick and free the oppressed. That is liberation, a truth from our Christological faith. And I have not seen anything here in terms of political sociology. I am all talking about theology and, bibli and biblical teaching. Any care for the sick which ignore system, structures responsible for creating poverty and oppression limits the healing mission to a palliative role. If I just look for those sick close to me and forget the system that get all the sick don't that is not look enough to come to be close to me, I'm just doing a palliative. Look at that one that could find me. But all the words has been neglected. This facilitate keeping and many times promoting structures of injustice. And that is the most ironical thing. In some places, especially in our neighbor country here in the south, we just keep playing the system. And we take care of that one poor and lucky enough to come to my door. But the way I'm playing the system, I'm responsible to create the 10, 20,000 poor that are not looking enough to come here because I maintain the same structure that create the poor and make them sick. Moreover, Luke 4 goes beyond the practical teaching of Jesus' mission. It is also a source for a theological understanding of our faith in God from a Christological account developed by the gospel. Luke 4 revealed the mystery of God in the mission of Jesus' disciple in a profound depth of interaction with the concrete historic experience of a community and its struggle. This demonstrates a harmonic secret relationship between scriptures and the experience and the experience of the community in history. In Luke, Jesus is anointed by the Spirit to lead a mission unchurched by the Lord, the Father. In his mission, the poor are present as the privileged recipients of the gospel message. His New Testament pericope points to a search for understanding the joint mission of the word, Jesus, and the spirit in communion with the Father. Therefore, it's revealing the Trinitarian mystery of the God. At the same time, the Lucan text suggests the mission of the church is to continue the work of Jesus in history under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Thus, this gospel allowed us to realize that the action of Jesus in history is guided by the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that will empower the church to continue the ministry of Jesus in history and make that harmony movement of historical Liberation is catalogical salvation, announcing the gospel of liberation to the poor as central part of the ministry. With this liberating gospel, the healing of the sick occur with no contradiction to practice of medical care and justice in health care. Because sometimes that is kind of seems institutions don't want our contradiction or I should care for the sick is here. I cannot fight for justice or change the system, as those things are not, cannot work together. The teaching said there is no other way but make those things work together with no contradiction. This is the most important thing that we learn from that passage, that the action for care for the poor and the sick that's lucky enough to find me when I was taking care of patients in Rwanda or Uganda, but also be my eye, my conscience, and my action to create structures 
that can support those patients that are not lucky enough to find me, but find the system, can care for them as well. And here I go to the last part of my presentation, a liberating approach in healthcare. Being rooted in the Christological faith that I just present that inspired the Catholic Health Ministry as Catholic Healing Ministry, as a historical continuation of Jesus' mission, means embody Jesus' actions in teaching and the practice of the Catholic Health Institutions. These include the option for the poor in health care. I bring the centrality of the specific to a, the centrality to a specific portion of his life, the centrality of the option for the poor to a specific context that the means for the sick, that is not exempted from operating without a care for justice and the poor. A liberation approach in healthcare inverts the most common way to see and address health issues. First, the common way is a top-down approach, that is, from healthcare exper experts and leaders from distant from the reality, distant from the reality of the poor, which prevent those experts from authentic productive dialogue with the local communities and the vulnerable populations. When you talk about public health strategies and global health governance, the top down approach is the mainstream. Is a bunch of people in a room called experts because they have some MDs and PhDs degrees. What's important, I'm not dismissing that, but it's just one side, they think. And I had the experience to be following what those experts has tell me to do, and they has tell me that put an IV in an Ebola patient to do a fluid replacement, that the only thing we can do to treat a person with Ebola it's not cost effectiveness. Therefore, give water to the patient until they die. And we just learned, for example, from Dr. Julio, that treatment is prevention. There is no prevention of treatment. There is prevention of treatment when the life of the sick does not matter anymore. We don't see that contradiction when you think about people with COVID in the US or Canada, for example. We treat and you want to prevent. We not neglect the treat because when you put all the money, only the prevention. Why you did that with black people in Africa? That is one of the causes is the top-down approach. People in Geneva where they make a decision based on the donors that give money from Seattle, the Bill Gates, that decide that that a needle is not worthy. Therefore, we can let that black man die with Ebola. So the preference shop for the poor invert this and make the victim of injustice be part of the process of care for those who are sick. And that's the only way you can start to work to build praxis and systems that include everyone. Top-down approaches, it's very aligned with new liberal health markets. They work together. And Pope Francis have said several times, the markets by themselves don't have the capacity to solve the problem of inequality and injustice in the world, include against the earth. As a result of that top-down approach in new liberal markets, patients and communities are excluded from active participation in decision-making process. And the poor and historic marginalized groups are also excluded from accessing health care. The focus of medical service with more potential for financial gain dismiss a comprehensive view of health care. That's so interesting. There is a, a very interesting book called The American Sickness. 
in which the main thesis of the author is say, every time we say in the United States, oh, the, our system is not working because there's a lot of inequality, and I talk about the US system, and the people dying, the author say, that's not accurate. Actually, the system is working because it's made to marginalize people. It's not made for the people, but made for the financial gain, and the system is became richer and richer and richer. In the middle of the pandemic, United uh, Care, one of the, uh, yeah, one of the, high, uh, the United Health, one of the largest health insurance of the United States in 2021, make 15 billion profit in the middle of the pandemic, broke all the records. The system didn't work to address COVID. It, it, according to the, it did work, but for itself. <laughs> Because never was set to work for the people. That never was the goal. And it is not. And I challenge anyone can prove otherwise. And the Catholic system that play with that play with that system, they just contribute for what Paul Farmer called the management of poverty. You keep manage that because that is a gain for somebody. So the system is working but not for the people, but for the market, for the, on the markets. So feeding the poor without asking why they are poor, struggling for the independence with their own reality, contribute for what I just said, poor farm expression, management of poverty. Manage, management of poverty provide gain for some people, even for those who say they are working for the poor. I don't accept that the CEO of a Catholic system closed a hospital, the only place in a, in a place that take care for the poor because they have a four million deaths and they closed the system and the same CEO making the same year 15 million. Who needs 50 million to live well? I live with way less than 100,000. <laughs> and I think I make a lot of money. I'm not complaining, I think I'm rich. That cannot, that's not acceptable. That's against the gospel. You should take the Catholic name of this as the way we take when a Catholic make a, a abortion in a hospital. We take the name of Catholic out that social sin should be recognized in the same way that abortion is recognized. But it's more challenge. Manage poverty, it's easy, because create or you contribute for the false historical determinism that a Brazilian philosopher affirmed that is imprinted in the mind of the oppressed. They believe that that's life, that will be life, and never will change. So they don't believe in the capacity to build the reality and make history. Paulo Freire understand that this is the source of oppression that invites everyone minds. If we still believe that it is the way it is, like in a very Aristotelical way sense, if you're a slave, you're born for a slave, you'll be a slave forever. If you're a craftsman, you'll be a craftsman, you're born to be a craftsman. If you believe in that, lie, because unfortunately the, what exists today kept is to make us to believe that, especially the poor. Those who didn't believe, they get better in life. Like, for example, some of us or me, but it's very hard. Our process of care for the sick is go beyond that historical determinism, because that's what Jesus did, did. bring the good news to the poor is let them to believe they, by their own agency, could be free. The poor have power in history. Once it is recognized and empowered, we have what Gustavo Gutierrez called the eruption of the poor in history. We just talked yesterday again, about the creativity of the poor. How we became creative when you don't have the resources. That is a power that cannot be, say, oh, the poor don't know anything. They do. They maybe don't have the medical skill because they don't want to the medical school, but they have other things to offer. 
In that sense, if you want to act to build justice for the poor, this must be with and from them, and not simply for them, and be apart from them, but with and from them. We do not liberate them, but they liberate themselves. And among us, we are liberated too. Paulo Freire suggests in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, liberation and justice can only happen from the poor. The poor not only liberate themselves, but also the oppressor, because the oppressing class does not liberate and cannot liberate by its own action, because nobody wants to live status quo. That CEO who made 15 millions in the same year, they didn't have four to save a hospital, to, the only hospital who cared for the poor, and then the mission is care for the poor. He doesn't want to lose his status quo and his CEO's club competition that we know that exists to show that I make 50 million or to just, because the healthcare CEOs in the United States, I'm talking about there, because I know, I don't know about here, is the largest payment average of healthcare CEOs, including the Catholic healthcare CEOs. Uh, and that's, you can Google that, you find it's all public information. It's not, the Christological option for the poor in Catholic ministry at home or abroad to be a ministry of mutual learning and liberation which the poor and their partners work together, learn from each other toward justice. This option leads us to join to the poor for the process of liberating from them in the social locus where these victims of structural violence responsible for health inequalities are. The option for the poor is a perspective from below, from the experience of the poor, that place their voice at the center of discussions and actions for the common good and global public health through their participation in decision-making process. So in liberation theology, or in the liberating approach, I'm presenting the potential option for the poor is a ministry that have an existential aspect and an operational aspect. It's existential because the commitment I do not to promoting the injustice that already exists, but a life of austerity and humility with the poor, or what Pope Francis said, be friend of the poor. And it's operational. In the same way, help us strategize public policies. Help us to understand that if I want to address, we not hurt a culture, Ebola, in the Kisi Triangle of West Africa, I need to go there, I need to sit with the poor, and I need to talk to them. And not simply say, you have Ebola because you eat monkey. You have Ebola because you are primitive people in the way you do funerals, because that's what happened. All you, for all this in the room, maybe remember the same story about the HIV epidemic in the early 80s. Blaming, the United States blame Haitians to bring aid to the continent, and then the research proved was the opposite. Cruise ships with tourists going to use prostitutes in Haiti that brought AIDS to the island, and not the vice versa. Uh, so, but if you're not being with them, we don't understand them. That's the gospel. Jesus went to live with the poor, listen to them. One of my other favorite passages of the gospel, when Jesus met the woman with a bleeding for a few years among the crowd, and he asked, who touched me? And then the disciples say, well, who touched you? Everybody's touched you. Well, like people pressure you. But he feels somebody touched with a different need. And it was very interesting because I see Jesus, he didn't, he could, he know what she wants. She wants to be healed. And she can say, okay, I'm busy because I'm taking care of the Jairus' daughter. I'm in my way. I don't have time to you. Here is the pill. Get healed and go on. But he stopped and healed. Hey, what's going on? Tell me your story. And then the gospel, she told all his story to him. And then he did, what do you want? He knows. If you are sick, what do you want? I want you to be healed. But 
but you listen. That's the difference. And it's important to listen as an aspect of the option for the poor, as imperative for us to attain the common good. I go to the end now. I say it became too long. <laughs> I'm sorry to make you tired. I see the option for the poor, and Francis say that, as an ethical imperative that lead us to learn from the poor and their suffering and their reality, but also not from the suffering as the ugly thing, but from the beauty of the poor bring to you. The document of Aparecida that is quoted by Francis, he quoted the Latin American bishop saying, only our closeness that make us friend can enable us to appreciate deeply the value of the poor today. They legitimate desires and their own manner of living the faith. The option for the poor should lead us to friendship with the poor. The preferential option for the poor suggests an ethic of personal commitment, friendship, and collective effort. It is not option against poverty to break, it is an option against poverty to break the cycle of violence against the dignity of human beings vulnerable because of the social economic situation. The option for the poor is not we want everybody to be poor. It's not the option for poverty. That has to be very clear. It's not that we want everybody to be poor but it's an option for justice. You know, everybody has what's necessary to flourish with dignity. The spirit, and then I, quote, I will finish with the, the passage that Jesus read from, in Luke from the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is on me, for he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives and to sign to the blind, to free the oppressed and to proclaim the year acceptable of the Lord. Jesus read this text from the prophet Isaiah in a synagogue in Nazareth, presenting it as a project of his public ministry. This narrative sorry, shows the centrality of the sick the oppressed and the poor in Jesus' missions, led by the Holy Spirit. Only in this passage you can see the entire trinity. The Father who anointed the Son, and the oil of the anointment is the Holy Spirit that guide the Son who act in history on behalf of the Father anointed by the Spirit. Therefore, care for the sick, the oppressed and the poor is part of the mission of his followers, our mission, also guided by the Holy Spirit. In a project of integral development, promotion of health care and well-being is an effort that needs to combine medical care for the sick and practice that build justice with the participation of the poor as agents of historical change. This is done by liberating the oppressed and raising the poor from their poverty. And it includes the active participation to attain the common good. And as a professor, I, I like to say the takeaway of that class today is that Catholic healthcare ministry, ground in the Christological faith that is in Jesus, is always a ministry that care for the sick and care for the environment that create injustice in order for us to create an environment of justice and opportunity for the sick to be healed and for the human to flourish. Thank you. We do have time for questions. Uh, <clears throat> I'll monitor them monitor them here online, but perhaps there are some questions uh, initially from the audience for your powerful uh, talk.
And Kev a Kevin, will you bring a microphone? Alex, great talk. Um, as John just said, I think the powerful is the, the word that comes immediately to mind. And I'm just curious to hear you say a little bit more perhaps about the challenges you face in sh you know, sharing this particular vision, right? I mean, um, I, I'm struck by how obvious this, this is to me, you know what I mean, as a Christian and the way in which I've been formed. Um, but the, the sort of the, the struggle to perhaps communicate the radicalness of Jesus's mission in a context where we, we always want to sort of, you know, make it apolitical, you know, sort of make it non-political, that Jesus wasn't about sort of conflict. Jesus wasn't about sort of uh, transforming sort of uh, social structures. Uh, and I'm just wondering how do you sort of navigate that, particularly in the American context? Um, what kind of pushback do you get? And, and how do you sort of, uh, I, I don't know, speak about this particular sort of the preferential option for the poor um, in, in that context? It's a great talk. Uh, th thank you. Uh, yeah, I have different reactions. And I try to be very honest in everywhere I go, you know, when I invite to talk or when I have opportunity. Uh, and the most common reactions I have First, I would say I have a reaction from the theological community, especially U.S. theological community, that the first reaction is they marginalize me, say what I do is not theology. <laughs> uh, that's a very common reaction. Uh, it's, oh, you're doing some sociology, you're communist, doing so, uh, sociological Marxism or whatever. It's, a, it's common. It, it, unfortunately, you still have here that People tell directly to me, or people tell for, to, in conferences that people who know me are there, and, 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 and not take directly to me, but the same idea, and came to discuss with me. I heard that. So it's, it's very common. It's a thing that Pope Francis have suffering a lot. Uh, there is a very interesting book I recommend called The Mind of Pope Francis by Marcio Borghese. He, he addressed it like that, how the theological community in Europe, in the United States, dismiss Francis as a theologian, say everything he does is pastoral, and pastoral is not theology. So it, it, that's the first reaction uh, I, I receive, it's common. It's, and then have all those uh, names now. Contextual theology is not theology. You just talk about narrative of, it's too personal, and blah, 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 sorry. Uh, that's one of the first reaction. Uh, the second most common reaction then more in healthcare uh, environment, uh, especially in Catholic healthcare environment, then have two reactions, two differently. Uh, I have the reaction of the silence. I would say it's the most one. People who, uh, who know that, understand that's the truth, don't want to confront, so it's better to be silenced. I can give an example. When I was talking to the Catholic Health Association, that is mainly sponsored by a system that had that CEO I mentioned before. Uh, and then the, the president of the Catholic Health Association was there, and I said exactly what I said here. She looked at me and turned her face, like an audience, and left the room. And didn't say anything, did confrontation, but that say a lot of things. My reading is, she understand that this is, is not absolute, it, it, it is what it is. But maybe that person feel powerless to change the system or, or am given the benefit of doubt, <laughs> right? So that's polite, nice, don't say anything, it's common. Uh, and the other reaction is, if you do what you're saying, the cattle systems will broke, will break, sorry, uh, and then we don't do nothing. Uh, or you became so small. <laughs> and then my answer sometimes is, be small, it's not about quantity. It's about also the things that's meaningful and create change, not simply manage the system that is there. Because that is 
what in global health, to be very precise, especially also included secular or religious global health initiatives, uh, we contribute more to the problem we are trying to address than address the problem we are pretending to address. You know, uh, in the Ebola outbreak in 2014, 2016 in Africa, in West Africa, for me is the most iconic example of this how we divide the world of life of people matters and people do not matter and you let the people in Africa die and we pretend we go there to help them and we end up being the heroes without being any hero because our own interest of Africa is the natural resources they can give for us to be in our Tesla's car and make feel us nice because you are not put CO2 in the atmosphere but of course that mineral that built that car cost many lives. So, and then I say, because there is still that, I didn't mention in my talk, but in my book I have an entire chapter about that, how global health, it, many initiatives of global health internationally, it's a new face of soft colonialism oppression. We just contribute more to the problem than solve to the problem. Uh, that's the common, of course there are good reactions too. Uh, but I'd say just two reactions, catalog theological and then health, catalog healthcare with none of the two, like three, is the most common. I, <clears throat> there is a question uh, from the webinar as well. I, sorry, I missed your hand. Go ahead, Marianne. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I, I can. I can uh, name some organizations. Uh, religious congregations, when I have, I know some or, uh, orders, projects, that's very small, but has done a very good actions because they've been, uh, whether religious or lay missionaries, they have go to a place to live with the community, and they had the experience they called the uh, insert communities, and then had established a long-term commitment to rebuild the community from the community, and not bring things from outside the scene, of course. And then there is that experience in the church called subsidiarity. We bring the resources from the top, but the decisions and the use are made and controlled at the local level. So I know, for example, there is uh, a work in my own country, Brazil, of the missionaries of charity from Ohio, United States. They had been there for over 50 years, included one sister, is a saint, is considered like, not canonized saint, not yet, but it's on the way, is considered a saint by Brazil because she, she was killed by farmers in agribusiness because what she was doing was not only take care of the poor people, but she was teaching them how not to lose their lands for the farmers. And the farmers got pissed with that and killed her. And what's the most beautiful thing, the sisters, the others, never left. And that was 15 years ago, they still there doing the same thing. And that's a good example. Uh, and because what they do, the Seas of Charity, many lay people from the United States, from all over the world have joined, go there to, lead, to spend a long time commitment. That's an example. Uh, uh, there is another organization that is secular by nature, but is Catholic by inspiration, called Parts in Health, that is funded by Paul Farmer. Uh, and he has his mission, preferring option for the poor in healthcare. He has he envisioned the model, because he just, he died last year, not going to a place to try to put a band-aid, but go to stay and make that place home and have a commitment that the locals will lead and we as subsidiarity, that's a complex, sometimes context, we provide the resources they don't need 
you know, you rebuild the community until they have their own resources. You know, we are just partners. We are not owners of anything. So just is uh, two examples I can give. And if you want hand, there are some work as organizational that has challenge and criticism. On the other hand, there are many people who are there working in those organizations. They are doing great things. And that has to be said. When I was uh, in Africa for the Ebola, everybody there peace because they couldn't do an IV. They are doing a great job. But they didn't want to contribute to management and the killing, and they fight against that. Uh, although the bigger organization, in that case, what World Health Organization, didn't want in that way. Because whatever organization is controlled by those who give the money. And they determine how the thing should be used. And that's totally against what I just said to you. Or in, a, in secular speaking, it's ineffective. It's very ineffective. It's so ineffective that what health organization apologized a few years ago for create be responsible for the cholera outbreak in Haiti 10 years ago, and then we just have a, one right now going on. Thank you for the question. I hope to clarify a little bit. Uh, just very quickly, because I like to uh, come away from a talk with something practical that I can do. So if you would, uh, if, if it was possible to just name even a bit of organizations that we actually can support by talking about them or even sending them money. So just... Mm -hmm. I, 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 I would suggest to you, you live here in Vancouver, right? There are a lot of, I learned on the three days I had been here, there are a lot of disparities here as well. That is, for as one of the problems I learned here, there's a lot of disparity with poor people or marginalized people because of uh, opioid dependency, for example, substance abuse. There are also disparities related to original peoples, like the native people. So my recommendation for you as practical is to start at local level, not trying to look uh, bigger, oh, let's help the poor in Africa. Yeah, that's important. We're not missing that. But as a pr if you want to go as a practical uh, suggestion, I would suggest, for example, you get engaged. And then here we have people from Providence Health here. Get engaged and then see how you can help. Because here in the city, the, the, just what I learned in those three days, uh, I see some projects that you could, could help with some marginalized communities that is here. Welcome. So this is a question from an attendee online. What should, what can Catholic healthcare do to further social justice in Canada where healthcare is universal, yet many, especially indigenous communities, are marginalized? And I suspect with respect to healthcare and, and other respects as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I am the most qualified to answer in the sense I don't know well enough the, the uh, Canadian he uh, universal health system, the public system. But I, I feel that one of the things the Catholic health care system can do here first, there is uh, a practical level of delivery care, like what Providence Health does. So there is one side of this, that all that work is in partnership with the system, if my understanding is corrected. So although it's a Catholic institution, it's working with the public system, not the, the market system, because like, that's not the case here. But it's the capitalist system. Well, one of, that's one, one aspect. I you see that aspect, the, the leadership and the people involved in that Catholic system in, should raise their voice to always to create projects, support projects, policies, and changes that address the least of the society. And there are examples of this. I visit one related to the HIV in marginalized communities here in Vancouver, supported by Providence and the public system as well, because it's, it's a collaboration that has destined resources and also advocacy for fundings 
or policies that will benefit and encourage the participation in decision making also in access health care for the marginalized communities. Like the, the leader of that project, I mean, have the, the motto like, uh, treatment is prevention. In my experience with Ebola, I, am, I see 100% that. We don't prevent from getting infected with a disease if you don't treat what, those who are sick. More people you treat who are sick, they get better, less transmission, therefore more prevention, more people benefit. So get engaged on those that already exist and raise their voice and brainstorm and bring new creativity and new policies is one way. The other way will be the political participation. Uh, I don't know the political system here, but I believe that um, maybe there are ways in which regular citizens can engage in political participation. And I'm not talking about necessarily being a politician, because why not, but engage in public forums and public and, and, and hearings and tall halls and things that we can talk and know uh, uh, councils or communities or things that you can participate in being a voice. And for the Catholic system, I encourage if if that do not exist yet, I will encourage you to create uh, bodies and uh, instruments where people can participate in the way you can listen to them. When we, for example, when a leader in a Catholic hospital uh, think about a policy, not decide that only in the room with the experts, but before that, engage people of the community to be part of the, the, the process or do what the church calls synodality. Because I think that's the method, not only for the church life, but also for our social political life. Any other questions? Oh, well, Alex, uh, well, that is, oh, we have good. Uh, our Excellent. last question. <laughs> So this is more a philosophic question than anything else. Um, I noticed in your talk many times you used the term common good. Um, a couple of questions. Do you think it is possible to speak to people in our Western society about what is a common good? I mean, and the reason that I'm asking this is a couple of years ago, I looked at the definition of common good on Wikipedia, you know, just for the heck of it. And in the first paragraph was, was the sentence, the common good of A and B is not necessarily the common good of A and C. As soon as you say that, you realize this essay has has nothing to do with the common good. It can't even be defined in that way. And then, I guess, the other issue is, I, I think it's possible to speak about the common good from the Christologic uh, perspective. The difficulty that I think we face in our society is that we have not laicized that to the point where non-religious people are prepared to listen to that. And I'm interested in your comments on what you think could be done about, about that. Um, it's a very good, good question. Uh, it's very interesting that the common good of A, maybe it's not the common good of B, is it's a very common thing we hear from students when teach ethics. Like, I have my ethics, why I have to learn about ethics? <laughs> that very uh, relativist uh, perspective, and, and, and that has been a huge challenge in our Western uh, mentality, the, the individualism, uh, in which uh, I have my ethics, I have more, even if that's not true, but there is a sense that it is true, and I, I just live 
based on the values I create from my mind and from nothing else. Uh, the language of the common good, of course, is, is very uh, catalog in the beginning, but have achieved secular environment. And sometimes they use the, the title of public good to define similar things. Uh, I think it's possible if we became less philosophical and more concrete and name what are part of the common good. And I try in all my discuss, I did that from when I took to the hospital, when I talked to the hospital. I mentioned common good is first of all, is participation. And then you be participation in what? What I am to participate on those goods that is important to keep you living well and grow. In that sense, I had to give a face for that. What do you need to live well? Oh, I need a house. I need uh, clean water, right? I need food. I need air to breathe. Uh, I need sanitation. I need uh, vaccines. I need health care. I need a job. I need education. And help people to realize concretely what they, we, especially in the Westerns mentality, like the global north, what has been understood that if not those things we cannot flourish as we expected to do in the 21st century. And then name this or leave them to name in a cell. That's the common good. So participation of the common good is one, you, the water you drink, it's clean. It don't make you sick. So you participate of the common good. Those who drink sick water, uh, dirty water in Haiti right now, because that's something is happening right now, and they are getting cholera, they are not participating of the common good. And then I remember, uh, I, I, you mentioned something very, very good. The language of the common good, especially the way we talk in the, the Catholic Church, has, has to be more licensed as. No. And that make me remember Carl Hunter that had that more existentialist to say, they used to say, if you, we Christians want our message still be some relevance, has to touch people's life existentially. So show concrete elements, you touch people's life because say, uh, do you want to drink the water that you make sick? And I, I say that to a politician, for example, in the, in the Congress, they say, no, why do you think it's fair people in that neighborhood just one kilometer from here to drink the water that makes them to have cholera? Your wife need, uh, you and your wife are pregnant, and you think it's necessary to have access to a safe birth, prenatal care, and postpartum care? Oh, yeah, but why do you think the the child of the poor cannot have access to that. It's not a common good. It, it's very hard for a person to argue it's not. Sometimes they will argue that oh, the market per se can fix that. And then you have to show examples that the market per se cannot fix that. An example of that I give, then I, I, I answer my, not answer, but reflection with you, uh, is the the, ecological crisis we are facing now. One of the solutions for the market has been the electrical car. And nobody is, at least in, in the mainstream media or, public, or, poli, or, poli, or political debate, nobody has been faced that that's not the solution. Because to have a Tesla car, and I take as close to my heart, we had to destroy all a river, the minerals where I grew up swimming. And the ex entire village don't exist anymore. And those people die. And it's still dying because it didn't stop after that. The people die, people disappear, the families never have been compensated, it's a, had, and they, it's still extracting the cobalt and any other minerals 
that you make the cars that rich people in North America and Europe are saying and be feeling good because they contribute for the global warming. However, they are solving a problem, creating other, even bigger, even bigger. So that, that's, it's uh, like a, how the market has solving things without solving. They just change the problem, but the market continue the same thing. That's all the profit they gain with that because they are not made for the people, they're made for itself. So I think the way to talk to the common good is, is be less philosophical and more concrete and give examples that touch our life. And I always start with water because we can't live without water. And it has been a huge fight worldwide right now about the privatization of the water resources. That will be the end, I think, if that happened. Yes, yeah, sure. I looked up the Wikipedia definition. They've changed that. <laughs> 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 A number of people must have spoken about it and complained. <laughs> well, thank you very much for all your patience to listen to me for that long time in a, in a night of a uh, Wednesday night. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Alex, uh, thank you so much. Um, you can't apologize for your biblical exegesis. Uh, the gospel has been preached tonight. This is a powerful reading of the gospel, clear, direct, challenging. Uh, challenging to those of us who live in the first world and what we need to do. We have just a little gift for you so that you can remember St. Mark's. Uh, a few things. Um, so I hope you remember your time here fondly. I know that we will remember your time here fondly. Thank you very much. Is that useful in the heat of the Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> yes, bring us to the Amazon. Yeah. Thank you. For those of you who are here and for those of you who are at home, keep this in mind. You might want to come next time. We have delicious baked goods uh, that are waiting for you and cold drinks, uh, so do join us. And thank you once again. <laughs>